<laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Ahead of the Curve. I can already see there's a few of you guys online. We've got Brett and Christy and Dan. Uh, hey, guys, welcome to another episode. And I've got my guest, Anna Haruzo, on board with me today. So, hey, Anna, how's it going? Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good, good. Welcome to Ahead of the Curve. So, Anna, can you give us a little bit of uh, a background of uh, who you are, where you are, what you're doing now? Okay, okay. So, so hi, everybody. Thanks for. Uh, oh, do you hear me with an echo by any chance? No, Sorry. no echo on our end. We're we're good on our end. Okay, great. So, so my name is Anna Haruza. Um, and uh, I, I, my, back, my main background is architecture, but I specialize in immersive environments and digital experience design, uh, interactive environments, and real-time graphics. Um, as Geoffrey mentioned in the description, uh, I have a kind of a multifaceted uh, profile. I'm also really uh, focus on education, and I, I have an academic background. I'm a prof professor. And I'm also a researcher and working on my PhD right now, and and yeah, so so I've worked in in, in live events. I've worked in uh, designing all kinds of interactive installations and uh, integrating media at large scale uh, architectural env environments. And also, I have like a career as an artist as well. So I experiment with different sources of light. And materials, and and I've done many experiments to see how how can we create different kind of experiences using light and material, and and, and many more things. So you're like you're you've got an, a tremendous amount of a background. It sounds like and very very diverse background with many many different things, and it's been really interesting um, from my perspective, kind of following your journey you know, working as an interactive design artist, but also working in the educational system and, and teaching. And, you know, it, it's, it sounds like you've got a very diverse and really interesting background. Uh, and you've been through a lot of the trenches, obviously, and working with a multitude of different companies, uh, like Obscura Digital uh, in the past. And uh, it, it's gonna be, I think it's gonna be really interesting to kind of dig a little bit deeper into, you know, your passions and what you've been doing. and. Um, from my understanding, you're in Spain right now, correct? Yes, yes, I decided to come back during the pandemic and, and finish my PhD use this year. Since, you know, the live events world is, is a little bit on standby right now, versus not talking about all the virtual production that's been like this amazing boom, but experience uh, and, and actual physical events, uh, it's on standby at the moment. So, so it was a good moment to, to continue my research and, and push pretty hard on that, um, on that end. Yeah, so, I think it's a good time for, it's a good time to do that. You know, a lot of people of course have been using the time to also educate, as I mentioned on a call with you, you know, a few days ago, a good friend of mine been working on his PhD in the background and being able to kind of um, accelerate the amount of time it's taking to be able to accomplish it. And there's so many people that are learning, uh, taking the time to be able to learn new things and new, learn new products. And it's been like a really cool time, I think, of exploration for like so many people uh, inside yeah. of our industry and outside of our industry. So, so yeah, I think, I think it's pretty amazing um, all the way around. So I, I was just thinking, you know, we've got a lot of great people that are, are here. I just want to say hi to Isabel and Richard and I'm glad we got the audio thing worked out so quickly. You know, sometimes those things can be quite the challenge when we're live. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to say hi to John and uh, yeah, it's so good to, to have everybody, you know, have the gang together. So Anna, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the things that you, some of the experiences that you've had, because you just had such a, a, a wide and diverse experience. And I love the fact that you've got like an architectural background as long as, or as well as a, you know, a media um, background. And I, I love to hear about like some of the stories and the influences that you've had in between the architectural world and in creating like real time media. Okay. So maybe I think I can walk you through a little bit of, of, of the history of how I ended up in, in this in this world. And and because as I mentioned, my background was in architecture and I was, uh, when I was still an architecture student and I was working on my master's, uh, in, in Europe there's like, there's a program called Erasmus and, and you can like, uh, 
that travel, you know, do a one year exchange in any other city in Europe. And I really wanted to go to Berlin. It was the time techno was uh, really big over there. Yes. <laughs> and I tried, but I didn't make it to Berlin. So I, I ended up in Paris, which was not bad either. And, and I met some German guys there that were doing Arduino. And it was 2005 when Arduino had just been released. And I got in touch for the first time of what our interactive and what interactivity was. And, and I was pretty fascinated. And, and in Spain, I was part of this art collective uh, it was an architecture art, art collective, but it, we were called it, called Fulorc. But we were really, really active, and we did a lot of urban activations and a lot of competitions. And we were really interested in how can you bring the user, how can the user of the space could have some say in the design of the space, or could you know have an opinion or, or participate in the design of the space. And and when I encountered all this inter interactivity world, I realized I was like, well, maybe with interactive environments, the user can actually become an active participator of the actual space. And that's when I became really interested in this world. And, and I went to LA, to Los Angeles, and I, I, I did a master's in that specialized in new media. And then I, I learned how to program on MaxMSB and I was blown away and started coding. And, and I was just like, and then projection mapping was starting to be a thing. And I was like, whoa, now we can augment the actual physical space. And then people can come and interact and change the space. So it was like, a, it was a, such a big deal. I was so blown away. And I was just, I contacted Obscure Digital, which was doing, you know, at that time, the largest projection mapping projects. Yeah. And and I was lucky, and I just I totally started and joined their software team, and and then I and I encountered Touch Designer, which you know coming from Maximus B, working with Jitter and the graphics, Touch Designer was just like I was blown away, as yeah. well, and 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 yeah, and a couple months after, I was already just writing playback systems and running show systems, doing dome shows, doing live events, and and I even to end up doing events with 18,000 people running all the show control and, and live visuals. That sounds like a, a hell of a progression in such a short <laughs> period of time. <laughs> it's not your spend, man. You know, I just told the story too bad, but, but yeah. So I just got into, um, well, really kind of diving deeper into Max MSP and actually Touch Designer a lot more recently than ever before. And it's been incredible to really kind of dig into the differences and how things work and uh, you know what what works really well in some, some places and what doesn't work well in others and mm -hmm. experimenting in between the benefits and the advantages to each of the platforms. So it's been really interesting, starting to really get a huge scope to be able to compare the different platforms to each other. And mm -hmm. I can tell you like, and I know Isabel's gonna love to hear me say this, but I've been absolutely like found a whole new admiration for touch and you know, how it works and some of the capabilities. And it's been it's been really, really cool kind of digging deeper into the platform and um, you know, seeing how everything works. So it's been, yeah, it's been really, really fun. Fun, fun and cool to check stuff, to check it all out. Yeah, it's so pretty I, amazing. I Pardon? It's a pretty amazing software. Like this yeah. has just so many possibilities. Oh, look, there's this little <laughs> hi. <laughs> so, and I thought it'd be cool to also show off some of the stuff and some of the work that you've done. Do you wanna? Do you wanna dive in and okay. uh, take a look at some of the stuff that you've worked on in the past and do a little show and tell? Okay. Okay. Let me see. Um, let me know. Um, are, you, are you ready for it? I don't. You, I didn't want to throw you off. No, no, no. It's fine. So, so the screen sharing is set up, right? Yep. Yeah. Just let me know if you want me. To, I'll just add it so, straight in here. Maybe I'll show some of the the um, projects that I worked in 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 media architecture since you know we 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 decided to talk with um and yeah. we would mention some of the architectural projects, uh, which I think it's uh, it's it's it's. It's within the live events. I think there's been a long history of having visuals already, right? Integrated in stages and and working with audio reactive 
spaces, but with an architecture, it's pretty new, right? And and we're bringing in, and it's it, it's an interesting field because uh, architects are always designing what the experience of the user is when they're going through the building. And now we have another um, other um, um, parameters that we can work with, which is having media that moves over time, right? This architecture is static, and it's you design mm -hmm. it, the architect is it, it's it's finished. But with media and with interactivity, it becomes alive. So I feel that all these new spaces and these companies like ESI Design uh, that are working on and, and developing these super large scale um, lobbies with inter integrating media um, are doing amazing, amazing projects and pretty innovative projects. So I was lucky enough to, to work with uh, A, B, and C and, 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 and ESI Design on, and on this project that's in New York. It's called, it's in, in the his, historical district, it's 85 Broad. And, and it was a complete renovation of this historic uh, building and of the full lobby. And they integrated all these different LEDs, uh, sculptures, and, and different kind of transparent LCD screens into the project. And and it was an amazing project to work on. I was uh, I was in charge of programming and and creating all, all the graphics in Touch Designer, all the, the real time graphics that were displayed and that, that were interactive. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They worked with uh, so we the, it was a pretty large project. It had a couple of arches in the front, and then it has these um, LED sculptures that go over the ceiling. They're integrated in the ceiling that had different animations. And um, here we see some more. And then um, I'll just go full screen right now here. Uh, oh. And as you see, they, they have these amazing, beautiful um, uh, CNC uh, milling, uh, milled um, maps of Manhattan. These were these old maps, and they were in the different lobbies. And what they did is that they, they, they created these LC, transparent LCD screens that were overlaid on these maps and then all the animations that we were making they were they they, they had to do with the space that was behind i think that's a, a, like a really amazing uh, scenario of integrating the physical with the digital space and and so it was it, it, all the animations that we created were m mostly interactive some of them uh, were like uh, giving information to the to the users that were waiting in the in this lobby, and they had we had transportation um, information, traffic information, Twitter feed, different animations with Twitter feed, etc. And and everything was synchronized and and running on Touch Designer for the whole building. And then we had a, a CMS panel that where the the, the client can schedule uh, different animations and different uh, media to play at different you know at, at different times of the day. And so this was like, a, I think it's a, a beautiful example of, of media integration with the digital environment. Yeah, and it's beautiful. I love, I love how uh, everything kind of really enhances the space and just kind of, it's super subtle at the same time. So it, it kind of gives a, a little bit of a, a grander illusion, I guess, you know, especially with the corridor kind of going down with those linear strips, you know, following along the ceiling line. It's it's quite, it's just stunning. Um, and I love the idea of the transparent uh, LED and the transparent overlays, uh, especially like enhancing the the aesthetic of the background and and the history of the building. So that's super, super cool. Uh, they, they did an amazing, you know, design project. It was, it was, it was it's, it's, they did a great job. And I actually was in, you know, actually exactly a year ago, I was back in New York right before the pandemic hit. And I was able to visit it, and it was all running, and, and same as all these pictures. It was just so cool to see, you know. When did, you it, did it bring see. a tear to your? Did it bring a tear to your eye? <laughs> yeah, totally. But it's just so cool <laughs> to see that your playback system is still running, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, and and then so, um, another project that I have here is the. Um, let me find it. Uh, so I was lucky enough. So I have a company with uh, some. Colleagues from from Obscura were called were Virtual Labs, and I was lucky to work with um, some Spanish architects on on these lux luxury cinemas that they were designing in in, in India and in Mumbai, and and we, we were in charge of the whole media integration, and and I was running all the creative direction and for it and all the content creation that we did for several LED walls, and and I think it's. Um, 
this project is uh, for 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 this project the the client had wanted to have some animations that were they had to do with this um, these icons of cinema and marketing project that they had and so we designed what we did is that we had like uh, the space was uh, full of it had like a panoramic LEDs uh, on the top. And then they had a large column in the bottom. And what our mission and working together with all the architects was to um, design the media in a way that um, the column was always synchronized with the with the full um, LEDs, panoramic LED, the 360 LEDs, and how all the media that we created was actually reactive to the actual space. So we created a lot of different kind of simulations that that liquid simulations. And uh, we have some other uh, popcorn simulations as the, the, the client really wanted popcorn <laughs> since it was a, a cinema. It's a cinema, and, right? It's a movie theater. Yeah. You have to so have we popcorn. These, exactly. We created these uh, popcorn kernels and we made them a little golden to match the style and the, all the design of the actual cinema. And uh, one of the coolest part is that the actual facade of the cinema was created when the architects had designed this uh, pattern for it. So what we did is that we grabbed that pattern and we used it as our, uh, it was like this architectural element that we used that as the, as the detonator for all the other designs. And, and, and so uh, most of our animations had these, uh, like the pattern overlay and then we, it just like would start rumbling and, and, and transitioning into different, uh, to different pieces. But it was always like, what I think this, it's really interesting about this project is the, the media and the content talks to what the design is. And it's also designed to interact and, and react to the actual space where it's being displayed. That's awesome. That, you know, that's one of the things I, I love about a really well thought out design um, is the ability to deliver the message, of course, of the space and enhance the space, but also, you know, have a, a fully uh, engaging and interactive component to it where it can live and breathe. Um, which I think is one of the really cool things about generative content and generative media is that you you can use so many different um, inputs and outputs and, and ways to be able to transform the way that media is handled and managed and created in so many really cool and interesting creative ways. So, it, you know, this is, I think, a great example of being able to do that, but on a level, like on a different level. and. That's one of the other things I think that I love about your background as well is that you've worked on a lot of like really high profile commercial um, projects, but you've also done a lot of, you know, a really kind of down dirty, gritty, you know, like experimental, we have no idea if this is gonna friggin' work or not kind of, you know, flow. So I love, I love to yeah. see that, you know, cause there's so much diversity uh, in between stuff that's being commissioned, you know, like this, for example, I'm sure was definitely very well thought out, storyboarded. Um, a lot of it was was probably- A lot of client management, you know. Yeah, a lot of client management, you know, expectations have been set, everything is, you know, pretty, pretty concrete. And then yeah. projects where you have a lot more, let's just say artistic input, uh, where yeah. you can you can challenge yourself and change things around and flip things around. Yeah, it's, like, it's such a different mindset, but I actually love both environments. I love getting my hands dirty as well and programming and, and but I really enjoy the other large scale. So it's cool to, yeah, I'm so lucky that I had the opportunity to just go from one project to, to others, but I can show some of my, you know, more artistic environment. Yeah, that would be like, cool. Let's go from one extreme to another. Let, let's, let's, yeah. let's take a, let's take a, a journey from okay. like polished projects to something a little more abstract. Okay, so I can show it here. We have uh, uh, this project that, that I did a couple years ago. Isabel was really familiar with it. She wrote an article uh, on it. <laughs> uh, designer. Well, maybe maybe and, we need to bring Isabel into the stream. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a project. So after working for so many years with projectors and and LEDs, I was like, oh, I just really want to try out lasers. Let's see. And, and I did think it was going to be pretty easy. And then I just ran into this huge wall. It was like, whoa, you know, you just, we needed the, all these protocols, the variants, you know, it was because we, got, we did a commission for, for a show in at, at a, at a New Mexico for this Taos, uh, Paseo Taos Festival. 
And then we realized that we needed all these permits and everything to work with lasers, all the security that you needed that you don't really need it in the projector world, right? And and I know that now now there's like there's so many resources that had come up for to use lasers in, in interactive environments. But at the moment it, it was like not that there were not that many much information out there to work in with touch designer and and but yeah I learned a lot and it was like an amazing experience and and we worked on this project um where we what we decided what we were trying to do is try to replicate natural phenomena using mm -hmm. laser we were, we're just the laser light was so bright and it would when we just started we got our first lasers and we're in the studio we just our eyes were like it just hurt so much and we're like it just really reminded us to thunder and 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 lighting. So we 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 had some nature inspirations, and we were trying to see how could we replicate uh, these um, these like this t sort of images and and phenomena with uh, using our laser machines and and so, so how, long, how long ago was this? Is, this was in 2016. Okay, yeah. So this is like five years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, four and a half years ago, I guess we started. Of, what, do, you, do you remember the lasers that you were using? Were they? Um, well, we were using uh, two, two, uh, a two thousand uh, milliwatts uh, laser. We're using um, at the moment from, and and so um, the, the what we designed. I just don't. I realize I don't have them here, but I have. I do. I could show a video. Uh, can I show a video? Uh, yeah, you can show whatever you want. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I'll just show it from here so we can get so what we did what we created is where we created this sculpture made of tubes where we had all these tiny smoke machines that we hacked so that we could control through DMX and all from touch designer at the same time. And and the idea was that we could we were trying to time when the 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 smoke came out of different tubes. Uh, with the with the uh, the light of lasers and also the tubes were transparent so when the the laser light hit these tubes it just would create these crazy reflections and and so I, I'll show here the video where you can see some of the effects that we're trying to create at the moment oh I guess the sound won't share right yeah no not not at the moment but yeah I think it actually is more effective just talking through it okay yeah yeah so here we can see uh, th th this <laughs> this example that's like the kind of sculpture we kind of created and and at some points you know it was also interactive and here we can see how we're trying to time the 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 light that came out at the, the same the time light that came the out with the smoke coming out of the tubes exactly exactly so we had to we had all these uh, a whole show system built to because you know the smoke machine can only run for like maybe 20 wow. seconds and stop for eight seconds and so we had this whole system controlling our uh, five smoke machines that were just pushing to these different chambers, and the chambers were just uh, spitting out the the smoke through the through these tubes. It is uh, absolutely stunning, like absolutely is. stunning. It's just beautiful the reflections that you get, and and that got me really really interested in in working on on uh, light and, and materials, and and how what what different effects we we can create. And so, see there we see some interaction between the smoke and the tubes. So and in this pro in this project, what was the biggest pain in the ass you had with it? Was it? I would say I, I would say it was actually the 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 laser in the beginning. It was just like all the the variance, getting the variance and getting all the paperwork and and everything was just like. <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning and and then yeah and all the the frame rate all the 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 scanning adjust all adjusting all the settings for to the laser so that it was smooth and super chill and we could get these really smooth images that were not flashing and and then later for for filming this we are joe picard uh you know filmed this all of our our and this installation, he had already had experience filming with lasers. He had done some some projects with Bonadali, uh, filming lasers, and he was already experienced in filming because that was another issue that we're, the the refresh rate and and banding from the laser would when you were recording it on camera, it would just not be smooth, right? You just have to adjust the settings yeah. for it. That that so, totally makes sense. I'm sure I'm sure the translation between even the time for the smoke to get into the chambers. 
and uh, being able to basically accurately queue and time everything, I'm sure that must have been a little bit challenging as well. You probably spent a pretty fair amount of time experimenting with the volume of smoke that you're going to be pushing through the chambers. Um, yeah. you know, how much space is going to be swallowed up? Like if you're going to be able to see two feet in front of you, um, and the way that the lasers refract off of the the smoke particles. Exactly, but all that was just really fun in the end. You know, it was just really cool test to to experiment with that. And as soon as we got the timings of the of the um, of the smoke machines, like you know, twenty seconds start, eight stop, we just built this whole um, uh, show system that had integrated all these cues, and it was already integrated in it. So we had it all. It was really well prepared for every every, every single animation had its own smoke animation time to it as well. That's awesome. Hey, honey, do you mind if I get a bunch of tubes and the smoke machine and some lasers? Not, you, not OK, not happening. No, I guess that experiment's not going to work for me. <laughs> she already wants to kill me. I've already got way too many science experiments happening in my office. So yeah, that's probably not going to work. Not going to work out very you well for me. You don't want a laser at home. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned a couple stuff, you know, like sometimes, you know, you just don't realize that there's just like one single beam going and it's just so powerful when it's just one point. And if you have a piece of fabric, it can burn it. So it's yeah, pretty yeah, it's crazy. It's it's an incredible the power of the lasers and what they're what they're capable of doing. We actually just we we're fortunate enough to just get a, a laser cutter here at home. So we got a, a Glowforge. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we've, we're we're figuring out like what the actual power of a laser is and and how it all works, and it's it's pretty pretty remarkable what you can do with lasers. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So I can show another project that I think in, uh, that um, this project inspired. I think I, I, I just was really excited to work with. So after we work after working with. Um, the tubes, I, I just realized I was like, oh, what happens with, what if I, I work with acrylic and, and I just laser cut the acrylic in a way that, you know, um, um, how, I forgot, I forgot the name. When you just scratch it, I just forgot the name. Oh, There's edge. a study. When you're etching exactly. it? In the laser cut. Yeah. If you start edging it and I, and, and see how this grabs the light and what happens. And I was lucky to get a art residency at the University of Texas, Austin at the, at the foundry. Uh, and they founded this project that I that that I started working with, and I made these sculptures, as you can see here, where they, I have like different types of edging, and I made these designs, these drawings and and designs, and I applied different materials to to these um, transparent plexiglasses, and some of them were edged. And as you see, this is a projector that is shooting into this into this uh, plexiglass. And as you so see- did you it have like different, did you have different opacities in the etching itself of the plexi or? So for example, the the the, the blurry, the, the part that's a little more blurry in the back over there, I had like, I, I bought different opacity um, uh, type of uh, plexiglass and that's uh -huh. glued onto it. So that grabbed a different tone, it was more matte. But what I really love was the edging. I think you can see here a little bit, you know, still the, uh, a little bit of the line. Yeah, this, you can kind of see see the contrast, especially between the white and the black. You can kind of see the. Uh, and the black is actually thing. transparent. It's just that we were in a dark room, and the transparent part is just not grabbing the light, but the edge part it just grabs it so well. So I think that was like a really cool experiment, and I created these really nice sculptures. Well, I really like them. <laughs> <laughs> and another project that I did. So was that this, was that for uh, was that for an actual like commissioned installation or? Yeah. Well, it was exhibited as part of the art residency at the University of Texas. Oh, that's so they, right. Yeah. They would bring artists uh, to stay uh, for a week or a couple of weeks there and work on 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 a specific project and then exhibit it. And at the same time, you could get the students would come and chat with you. You would have different talks at the university meet everyone from the program. They have an, a really nice uh, interactive program, it's called Play, and it focuses on new media and interactive environments. So it was part, it was aligned with this, this academic program. And, and yeah, and another experiment that I worked with this artist, this amazing artist called Vanas Farahi, 
And and what we did is that we worked, uh, we, we instead of working with twos, now we started working with smaller <laughs> sizes of plexiglass. And we're like, hey, check out all this amazing stuff we could do with, with etched plexi. Let's exactly. move into much smaller, like tubular plexi. Yeah. Exactly. And then in, in, in this one, we're working with lasers and, and we created this sculpture that had all these uh, different size uh, tubes and and it was also interactive and we would just work with the laser and how to time it when when somebody could touch it. The idea is to it's for a prototype for a larger, for example, a media, uh, an architectural large wall, for example, that that it's it's a tiny prototype for a larger project. I think it could be quite beautiful. Did, did that uh, did that project ever come into fruition or was this just did it just get to proof of concept phase? Yeah, we just created we have four four sculptures that we made and and yeah, that's where it is. I'd love to hear from the viewers too, you know, if you guys have been experimenting with anything during this time or just in general, it would be really interesting to maybe hear some, about some of the projects that you guys have been working on. Um, you know, and you can share those links inside of the chat. So it'd be really cool to kind of take a look at some of the stuff that you guys might have been working on too. So Anna, yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to, to cut off your, your train of thought there. No, no, I was done there. I was done. I was done with <laughs> art projects. I I love I love the the transition and the change because like doing stuff like this where you're interacting with the technology, but you've got that general purpose because you've got that whole human element to it. You know where where you're kind of mixing in um, the curiosity of our minds and guiding us. You know to be able to engage and um, to be able to become part of of the exhibit like that's one of the things i really think is such a huge kind of um uh tap on the shoulder if you will or like gratification when you can really pull something off like that and it's so effective um i remember a lot of the exhibits and a lot of the the different things that i've experienced you know a lot of the things that i always relate back to is the actual experience i had within the exhibit and I always remember how I've engaged or how I have been engaged in that piece of art or in that in that installation. And it just it's just such a different feeling than observing, say, be observing a piece of art when you can exactly. actually be immersed in it and you can be engaged with it. And, you know, there's a sense of meaning behind it uh, or there's a function to it. You know, it's it's really it's it's just really great when that happens. You know, and it's really great to see that kind of come through a lot of the work that you do. Yeah, yeah. Actually, for example, the project that I have right there, this project here, this was a, a laser project that we did also at another commission for in Milan. And I did it with uh, Virtual Labs. And, and we, it was part of the Digital Design Days and Off uh, conference. And and it, it's exactly what you're talking about. We tried this. It was like um, we this in this case we had larger lasers. These were six thousand watts. We had two. We had a scrim in the middle. And what we did is that all the designs uh, from one laser interact with the designs from the laser from the other side. So we created pretty uh, interesting animations that were created coming from different types of beams from each side. And then everybody was under. And then the part that relates to what you were talking about is that we had this other interface built in Unity where we could, um, where the users could customize the design that they wanted to see. And they could choose uh, like circles, if we want to, the, the colors and the different type of animation that it was going to come out. And, and then we had a 360 um, camera. So after the, after the user would customize their design, they would just run away with the picture of them within the laser environment with, with the, what we had designed for them. Well, what, no, what they had designed to be displayed <laughs> on top of them. So we just that's, made the tools for them to create designs. Yeah, that's super, super cool. So they get to have a lot of fun again, kind of mm -hmm. artistic. Uh, liberties to be able to express themselves and ex ex experiment in a lot of different ways, um, yeah, which and is and then get away and then get you know get yeah and then it's cool to you know because they would just they could enter their email and they would just take get that photo and and keep the design that they made and take it with them. That's awesome. That's super impressive. So Anna, I I wanted to also. Um, 
touch base with you about your transition between, you know, basically being an artist and still an active artist, but also moving into the world of education and um, teaching. And it would be really interesting to kind of hear how that transition has happened and, you know, um, the impact that you've had in, in moving to teaching what your, what your passion is. So, so yeah, I always had a call for education and, and uh, I always like uh, through college, I was taught in Spain, I, I was taught English uh, to kids. So it was part of my, you know, my financing for college. And, but, but I always wanted to be, be part of the university. And after I left Obscura Digital, when I started freelancing, and I was doing all these cool projects, but I also had time and, and the freedom to to teach. So I started teaching and I was lucky to start teaching at this program at Woodbury University. And that was uh, starting to work with uh, with new media. It was called Media Technology. And then after teaching there one semester, I was uh, asked to to be the chair of the program and direct the, so like, the program. So you, did, you, you, so you did way too good of a job then. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know, but but yeah. So I took. You didn't over. know it. You didn't know it, but you did. <laughs> you know, but I didn't know what I was getting into. That's the other thing. <laughs> and and yeah, so I started running this program. They were changing it. We changed it to the name Applied Computer Science Media Arts, and we redid the whole curriculum. And and it's turned out like an it's been an amazing experience, and it, as well for me, you know, having to. Since it was a program that works with art and technology, I would have to like research what are the latest tools and uh, out there in, in, in terms of technology that we can apply to art and what can we do with it and what kind of courses can we offer that can bring this all this knowledge to the students and for them to create and innovate. And so it's it was it's been super interesting and we've done pretty amazing projects and and I've, I've taught a lot of touch designer in this program <laughs> and I've done pretty. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a great tool, actually, for 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 an educational environment as well. And because yeah, you can you can keep everything very simple, but you can dig really really deep at the same time. Exactly. And the, and the students, if the student wants to go far, you know, continue continue digging in, they can, and they can go really really far. So that's kind of a, you know, it has so much potential that some students who just really, really like it, that just like that do end up doing pretty, pretty complex projects and interesting projects. And also, you know, if you give them enough tools, they can already start like some if the students not as technical, uh, they can just start doing pretty cool and rewarding like audiovisuals uh, quite fast, which is it's good for a student to just, you know, to get a rewarding like a result fairly, fairly soon. It, it encourages yeah. them to continue working and exploring. So. I was just going to say, I think that kind of applies to all of us these days. Like everybody's <laughs> kind of like gone totally ADHD and we want instant results as quickly as humanly possible. True. That's so true. Having these, these visualization tools that we can create really quick visuals out of and get an end result. It's like, yeah, I did something cool. You know, we can <laughs> yeah. move on. Exactly. Like, oh, I want to do more. Right. And then you just get into it. <laughs> exactly. So I'm going to yeah. push the rewind button just for a second. And Jeff Grants, hey, Jeff. Uh, Jeff was a guest on the show um, a number of episodes ago and uh, did a great kind of the same thing we're doing here, actually showed a lot of projects that he had worked on and um, is also a very accomplished designer. So Jeff was, was asking, he assumes that um, the project that you had showed previously, we can bring that back up really quickly just here. Um, accompanied was, audio or, or was there a cor any any correlation between uh, sound and light so so yes and this actual video no because this is a video edit right it's it's just like the the actual sound that this video has does not but the actual installation yes so uh, every single one of these um, um, animations was also audio reactive so we had like a, a library of sounds that from nature that we would play when we exhibited this at the actual uh, festival. And and we had like a, a MIDI controller where the the audience could come and play with the buttons, and they would actually the all, all the lights and the audio would react to to those sounds. Awesome. So, do you have? I'm assuming that there's probably a lot of audio components uh, in a lot of the pieces that you've created as well. I'd I'd imagine. 
And um, it would be interesting to also hear about, you know, like how what what parts when you're working on a, on a piece of on a piece that you're commissioned for or that you're working on independently, you know, what what are the parts that are that kind of most reach out to you right away? Do you do you find yourself more um, enthralled with the audio? aspects of the installation or do you move to visuals right away or are you working on them at the same time like how do you approach it um, yourself it just really depends on the context and the actual project um i would say like for example now i've been <laughs> doing a lot of i've been doing electronic music a lot lately so so i have a, a friend artist here who's up, who's exhibiting in a gallery and she's opening her gallery and she wants us to perform and for example she what we're doing is that we're going to have an audio uh, uh, reactive uh, performance where we integrate her all her paintings are going to come alive within the performance right so this is actually a, 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 in the context of this project just totally, you know, it has to do with audio. No, it actually, it's the music who's gonna bring alive those pieces and and as uh, they would be like showcasing behind us while we perform. And, but it really depends. And for example, those those pieces that I was making for the for Texas were just like more just static sculptures that just have their, they just grab the light and that's all you want. No, the attention uh, that I was looking for was to look at this piece and, and just, uh, understand and, and, and look at the beauty of how the material is grabbing the light versus, you know, uh, an audio reactive piece. It just, uh, it just really depends on, on the context that you're working on with. On the context or, of your project. Yeah, I was exactly. just wondering if you were like naturally attracted towards any, any aspect of like where your, where your kind of your, your immediate passion falls or lies, like what you get excited about when you start to work on a project. Um, I think is kind of what I was digging into a little bit more. Some people, like for myself, I really like to start working on the visual aspects before the um, audio parts of, of something that I might be working on. Because I just love to kind of dig myself down that rabbit hole and see what I can whip up before and get inspired by the visual aspects. But some other people get much more inspired by listening to things or some people might get more inspired by even like <laughs> sense or smells or textures or feeling things, um, you know, to start working. So I was just wondering if there was a component for you that really kind of calls out to you uh, when so you start drawing, drawing. Hand drawing. Hand drawing. drawing. That's how I start. Yeah, I, I always draw. I've done since you know, since I was in school, architecture school is how I think. I think by drawing, and and so so it usually starts there, and then you know I I just incorporate. That's my thought process, and it begins. So I guess it starts with design, and and then I'm really I'm I'm a pretty technical person, and I and <laughs> you I just know. <laughs> I, I I don't <laughs> I like I really like gear and stuff and, and I like to experiment with new technology so I, whatever toy is out there I kind of want to try it and see what can we do with this if there's something new I just really like learning stuff because that's what really uh, draws me like learning something new and doing something that hasn't been done before right so so that would be like I guess that innovation and exploration and mm -hmm. drawing and, and I love working with sound I just um I, I love the audio world. So if I can never incorporate it to a project, I'll, I'll try. Yeah, I've, I've always like, for me, I've, I've really enjoyed um, environmental audio and going into spaces where the environment is really, really well done from an audio perspective. It's just incredible how much it can kind of engage with you and draw mm -hmm. into your soul. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's, just, it's just totally insane. So um, what have been some of the, like what have been some of the things that from a project perspective when you're working on an installation or an activation uh, or a live event, have you, do you have a preference on, on which one that you like really, that you prefer to work on? Or is there, you know, like, are there elements from working on a, on, on a different style of event that kind of really 
engage you or really speak to you? Um, so, so I can show one of it's one of my favorite projects ever, um, that was uh, when we did the live show at the uh, with the Blue Man Group with Obscura Digital, and mm -hmm. so I can uh, I have it here, and um, so oh, perfect. So, so. <laughs> So this was a show that we did, and 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 the audience was eighteen thousand people, and it was a, a live show, and we were created. It was the Blumen Group was uh, uh, playing with the Hollywood Orchestra, so we had like so many musicians on stage, and so many things were happening, and and so uh, I was in charge of running the whole playback system and running all the uh, real time live effects. Um, and some of the uh, some of the tracks were, you know, uh, had a backtrack and were just sent through Simply. But we had a lot of several tracks that were just live. And what I had to do is like I had to listen to all the music that all these musicians were playing, and memorize it and just realize when do I have to change to different cues. And I was just another musician, and it, it was pretty. It was just really amazing how we were just like, depending on, you know, there was this Brazilian band that would just sing suddenly, oh yeah, and we had these animations that came out with the oh yeahs and all these yeah. things. And, and we, we we were synchronized with the with the fire, uh, with the fireworks. So the when the blue man would just go to the wall and light a match, I would just light the other match and then the fireworks would go. So it's just like really interesting to be, you know, feel even though I was not making music, I was just, uh, another, you know, part of the whole band. And I think this was like a really, really, really exciting uh, project. It was, I think it was, it was beautiful in my opinion. It looks gorgeous. It looks absolutely stunning. Yeah, and, and I mean, the quality of work that always came out of Obscure was just top notch. I mean, that was, it, it's, I think it was just a staple. I was always blown away by the quality of work that came out of Obscure. Yeah, and we had so much fun doing all the projects. <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing team. Yeah, it was great to uh, great to be able to uh, be in the offices there in San Francisco a number of times. I had the opportunity to be there and be involved on a few things, a few projects here and there involving Obscura, and it was it was always a, a great experience to to work there. Just so much yeah. incredible talent. So we've got a, a couple of more minutes um, before we wrap up, and I just wanted to address a few questions that popped up here. So Jeff was asking again, um, what have you seen or experienced in the last year, of course, during COVID, uh, that has changed the way that you work or concepts you might be working on in 2021? Mm, interesting. Well, what I've seen is have seen like a huge boost on XR, which yeah. I, <laughs> uh, Jeffrey's been like, Reviewing a lot of people working on that. So I think like within our- I don't field, know what XR is. Can you explain it to me, please? <laughs> Not again. <laughs> <laughs> Not again. <laughs> I guess virtual projection, right? In, in that world. In in my case, as I'm working, I'm researching a lot and I'm, you know, pushing on my PhD. And I'm, um, I think it has to do with the question. I read the question that then I had yep. wrote with guys then. And, and he was questioning like, what is my opinion on new technology? And, and a lot of what I'm researching is, is like, what are the ethic consequences or, or how should we, we, we're using all these new technology applied to the world of art, the art world, right? But I feel that we need to have like a critical, also uh, a critical look and what are the impacts or how does it affect um, working just all these new technologies, uh, applying them to, to, to interactive art. And, and interaction with humans, and 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 especially now that we're using, we use surveillance. You know, we should use a lot of camera tracking, face tracking, fa face analysis, uh, analysis. So, so what as as what Sven is asking here, I I I I think it's a great value to to be able to use new technology and apply it because we can do you know uh, inimaginable projects that were not thinkable 10 years ago, but there's uh -huh. also a new set of parameters that we need to, I think, reflect on and, and understand how, especially in interactive pieces or when we use data from, from, from users, from the cities, uh, you know, have some, there's some ethical concerns that we need that, that actually are parallel to things that are happening in our digital world right now with surveillance and, and privacy, et cetera. So, 
So that's where my core research is right now. It'd be interesting to hear what some of your findings are, you know, when you've basically come to some conclusions, because yeah. I've definitely brought this topic up a number of times um, mm -hmm. on shows previous and just talking about how, you know, how our privacy in way, in, in some ways, of course, it's, it, it, well, not in some ways, in all ways, it's very important to us to be able to maintain it. But it also limits a lot of the ways that we interact with things. Um, and it also kind of, it, it, it impedes on on the way that we that we work, live in, and act in society as well. I mean, you, I always say it every week after week, and I'm sure like everybody in the whole world is sick of hearing me say this all the time, but it's always trying to find that balance, right? It's just trying to find mm -hmm. that balance of, of acceptance for ourselves and what we accept as a society, as a culture, as, as a human being um, to what we're, we're willing to commit to and then what we're willing to, um, you know, what we're willing to allow, I guess. So, yeah, it's exactly. kind, of, kind of crazy. So on uh, Jeff Grant's last little comment there, um, X equals porn, I think that's a great place to close the show out. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> Jeff. I'll, maybe we need to bring you back for another episode on that topic. <laughs> but anybody who wants to get in touch with Anna, you can reach her um, at, through her website at annaharuzo.com. And uh, Anna, we've also got your Gmail account here as well. So those who want to directly contact Anna, you can reach her at annaharuzo uh, pierce at gmail.com. And Anna, I just want to thank you so much for being on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> I guess Jeff is not up for that. <laughs> but it's been a pleasure having you on the show with me today and just having that, that insight into what you've been doing has just been absolutely incredible. And thank you so, so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed this talk. It was really fun. Thank yeah, you. me too. And it has been amazing like how, time, how quickly the time has gone by. So uh, next week, um, I've also got a few other folks that you might be uh, familiar with coming on with me. I've got uh, Elbers uh, Sorkabi from uh, the Interactive and Immersive HQ, and those who know, know those who know of Elbers, another uh, very very talented touch designer um, artist. And then we've also got Arminas uh, Kazluks. I'm never going to get that right. Armin. For those of you who know him, who is a product specialist from Notch, so I'm going to have both of those very talented individuals with me uh, on the show next week. But Anna, thank you again so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, Greg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, bye, bye, everybody. Thanks for bye, attending. everyone. Thanks for thanks for being on the show with me, Anna, and thanks to all of you who've been viewing. And as I say every week, stay ahead of the curve, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.